to all of our guests while we wait, uh, just want to make an announcement, please. If you could be sure to keep yourself on mute unless speaking directly uh, at that time, it'll cut back on the chatter and make it easier for staff with the transcription. And with that, Council Member Farrelletto, we are good to go. We're live now. Okay. Uh, from the top. Committee on Legislation, Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. Council Member Farrelletto. Here. Council Member Columbeck. Council Member Nowakowski. Here. Council Member Rivera. Present. Council Member Scanlon. Council President Pridgen. Council Member Bowman. Here. Council Member Wingo. Present. Council Member Wyatt. Here. Quorum is present. Item number one, local landmark 438 Walden. Items open. For this item, we are going to schedule a public hearing to take place on October 6th. So. Council member. As we need a 15 day notice for landmarks, we would have to send it to October 20th. Okay, so the motion is to set a public hearing for October 20th. Motion to table. Okay, um, so we're setting the public hearing for October 20th and motion to table seconded by council member Bowman. Item number two, notice of intention, naming parcel at Main and North Division Streets, Nikola Tesla Park. Motion to table items two, three, four, five, and six. Motion to table item two, three, four, five, and six by Majority Leader Rivera, seconded by council member Wyatt. Item number seven, violations of the city's apprenticeship law. Items open. This item is open. Was there someone here to speak on this? Hi, yes, Councilman. This is Matt Kent, New York Foundation for Fair Contracting. Okay, Matt, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your time, Councilman. Uh, um, Mr. President, uh, Chairman, members of the committee and the council. My name is Matt Kent, senior analyst with the New York Foundation for Fair Contracting. Uh, as we've described before, we're a not uh, watchdog, not for profit group that works to level the playing field in public works construction. We do this for the benefit of workers, public owners, and taxpayers. Uh, what gets us out of bed in the morning is ensuring that everyone plays by the rules, that working people are provided for, and that cheaters don't prosper off of taxpayer dollars. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to join you again and discuss the important issues of apprenticeship opportunities on Buffalo construction projects. Uh, previously in testimony before the council, I addressed uh, the issue broadly. Uh, to supplement that, I, I do believe uh, the Department of Public Works and Office of Diversity and Inclusion were uh, invited today. So I was hoping uh, with their participation to address some of the outstanding questions. And my apologies if I direct a statement at DPW that would be more appropriate for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I'm not quite clear at this juncture where the various compliance obligations lay, um, but broadly by obtaining documents from the DPW through freedom of information requests, the Foundation for Fair Contracting has been able to conduct reviews of contractors' compliance with City of Buffalo apprenticeship requirements. Uh, in many ways, we are attempting to conduct analyses that city law charges administrators uh, in the administration and elsewhere to conduct prior to awards during construction and upon project completion. A uh, central goal of our foundation is to assist municipalities across New York State in policing their public works construction markets. Uh, you know, we recognize that budgets for public administration are tight and uh, likely gonna get worse. And as such, dedicated civil servants are stretched thin. Uh, that's why we try not to have an adversarial relationship with public bodies. Uh, instead, through such analyses, we are attempting 
to supplement and support civil servants, dedicated civil servants who are given lots of obligation, even when they can't be given lots of backup. Uh, so as part of that mission, our foundation, we provide trainings to municipalities on a wide array of topics from freedom of information to rights, responsibilities, and best practices under New York State Labor Law, General Municipal Law 103. And we would be eager to assist with any ongoing enforcement analyses by either DPW or diversity and inclusion, should they be amenable. Uh, with regards to employing apprentices on Buffalo projects, the Common Council has uh, legislated the matter and rightfully set a high bar. Uh, we come to you because we have identified unmistakable instances of the law not being adhered to. We are requesting the council continue to demonstrate its oversight capacity to ensure compliance with the laws you have rightfully passed. Uh, and I am thankful to say we are where we are today only because of the council's attention and concern. We had gone month after month after month of inaction and lack oversight until the council interceded. Uh, now we have an award to Amherst Paving that is conditional on an investigation into allegations of probable noncompliance. Uh, violation enforcement is being pursued uh, against DNH Paving for willfully breaking the law on apprenticeship employment. Uh, given the serious and persistent nature of these violations, we would be discouraged to see them receive little more on a slap on the wrist and as such would welcome the council's continued attention. Uh, and our fear being that should the council turn its attention away from pursuing apprenticeship enforcement, the status quo may persist. Uh, and towards that end, we wanted to help supplement with you know, questions to facilitate uh, best practices. Um, I know before the council on September 1st, Commissioner Finn told the, told the council he would be responding to the concerns raised by the foundation uh, with regards to apprenticeship enforcement. Uh, had, and I am curious as to whether or not Commissioner Finn has provided that response uh, promised three weeks ago. And if so, is a copy available? Uh, I appreciate the comments. Um, just a reminder to everyone in this committee, we have a three minute um, speaking limit so we can get everything done. Um, hopefully on time, I know we have a committee meeting scheduled the two, which we'll probably already go into. So if you can just wrap up your comments and then we'll move it forward. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, my apologies. I, I was misconstrued as to the time constraints here. Uh, so uh, we had, in our communication to the city council, we had provided a series of questions titled questions to compliance. Uh, and we would welcome DPW, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, to engage with and provide answers to those questions. Um, some of these include something as simple as, has a bid ever been rejected for failure to demonstrate compliance? Has a contractor ever been identified to be not compliant or not provided the needed documentation and still been recommended to the council for award? Uh, questions like these uh, are, are serious in nature and we appreciate the council's ongoing interest and attention and Thank you for your time and consideration. We'll be happy to engage with any questions you may have going forward. Thank you. Colleagues, any follow-up? Council President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, thanks um, for the presentation. Um, just so that, and I won't comment on it when we get to that item so that uh, I don't repeat myself. Um, there are other items um, about, since we uh, received the last presentation that I filed with the council that are supported uh, by, that also have other co-signers on. And one is uh, the contractor documentation of apprenticeship. So basically after hearing the presentation in our last meeting, um, what we have put forward is that a contractor will have to when a a bid is or when we have an RFP and that, that person that company comes before uh, the council for the ratification of the contract that we would like to see we we will see what we are saying we must see uh, what that contractor has done in the past five years as far as far as fulfilling the apprenticeship. Um, uh, requirement. And if they have not, why have they not? 
Um, and so that is um, in, in item number eight when we get to it, because I think it is very important. We don't have time to, the council doesn't have the expertise um, to be able to go back and do that research. And I think if it becomes a part of what we always do, that that's expected, then we can ask those questions and a contractor, because I don't want to see a contractor continually get work and not comply unless it is an area where they definitely could not find anybody. But then we need to know that because then that allows us to then also be able to say, maybe this is an area we need to let our communities know that they're not able to find. I see, I know the commissioner is on. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to take a look at that and whether that process could actually occur. Uh, thank you, Council President. Good, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Michael Finn, Commissioner of Public Works. Um, I, I did review the the resolution that, that you submitted, and I, I would uh, uh, entertain more discussion on it because uh, I, I don't think I, I was following it clearly. That we submit five years of past um, uh, past compliance. I, I think that's certainly something that we can uh, tell contractors they're required to do as a uh, as a condition of submitting and being awarded a bid. Uh, that also would take some of the onus off of uh, city employees to have to uh, keep track of all this. It, all, it all ultimately puts it on the contractor to uh, document and uh, prove their, their past practice. Uh, and I do think that that's something with, with further discussion that we can get into the details on. And uh, I'd be happy to, to work with you and, and the, the rest of the council to put something that, that can work for both of us uh, to improve this process going forward. And I really appreciate it, Commissioner. At the at the end of the day, um, it was, I believe, approved by the council. Um, and so this is the remainder that has been sent um, for the discussion of it. Um, and so, so that contractors and everyone else is clear uh, because I don't want contracts to be held. It would be on the contractor. If they haven't done five years of work, then they don't have to provide that. If they have, they will. Um, because it was voted upon, it will be the procedure of the council. Um, and if we need to tweak it to make it better or however you feel, you know, we can, we can work on that. But going forward, those contractors, um, if they have apprenticeship training, if they are supposed to have an apprentice, um, this council will request that before the contract is approved according to the resolution to be heard on number eight. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Councilmember Wyatt. I know this came about because of the project for Suffolk. Commissioner, did you look and make sure that, that the company that we are given the contract to with conditions were in compliance with the apprenticeship um, portion of the agreement? Uh, yes, and we're continuing to look at uh, a number of items with respect to the award of that contract, um, both their ability to comply as well as their ability to complete. Um, Amherst Paving has a number of projects right now, and you know there may be more rationale beyond just the apprenticeship compliance that we would look towards when we're considering awarding a contract. And we're looking to do that contract this year, correct? We're, we're trying. Okay. Thank you. Majority Leader Rivera. I think you're still on mute. Thank you. Um, I said that uh, I think we need to be a little more proactive and do some due diligence on our side. Uh, this is coming before us because New York Foundation for Fair Contracting has done an analysis. Um, unfortunately, um, sometimes we don't have people to do those analysis for us and the council can't do it. So we're dependent on our Office of Public Works or Office of Diversity and Inclusion to do this, to kind of raise the flag and say, hey, they're not in compliance. Uh, so I'd like to see um, some safeguards, some guardrails on our side in terms of our P DPW department Department of Public Works and the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks here going forward. I wanna thank Matt Kent 
and New York Foundation for Fair Contracting for bringing this to our attention. But it's something that we should be doing internally and not wait for organizations outside of city government to come and tell us, hey, we're not doing our job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shatora Donovan. Um, thank you so much, Majority Leader, for your comments. And um, I would just like to give a, a brief timeline of uh, the changes that have been made in contract compliance since 2018, so that this honorable, honorable body knows that between the Office of Diversity, Opportunity, and, and Inclusion, the Department of Public Works, and the Law Department, um, we have been working very diligently on shoring up our compliance process. So predating um, myself starting Anna Falikoff in, in the law department, along with a representative from DPW, changed all of the forms um, in our bid package and post bid for compliance so that we had a more comprehensive form, um, you know, forms that the contractors had to fill out and um, that hit all of the areas of compliance. So that includes apprenticeship, but also includes um, other workforce goals like minority workforce goals, female workforce goals, as well as uh, resident, city of Buffalo resident workforce goals, as well as our minority and women utilization um, goals. And so those forms really set the path for what we did next, which was um, in 2018, we purchased uh, the software B2G Now and LCP Tracker. And then in 2019, we uh, made it live to our contractors, both subs and primes. And our approach since um, making these new changes has been one of a comprehensive education campaign throughout the community. So our for first goal um, among the three departments was to make sure that we got the word out to all of our contractors about the new way that uh, we were holding contracts uh, accountable to our compliance requirements, as well as um, how we were not only holding them accountable, but also helping them to be successful throughout this process. So uh, our goal, first and foremost, was to make sure whoever had a contract with us was successful in engaging with the goals, whether they were workforce or utilization goals. And so we've done several seminars with the Construction Exchange, the Small Business Development Center, the Beverly Gray Business Exchange Center to make sure that everyone is on the same page with our new process. Um, when you are a large organization like the city of Buffalo and you do business with so many different entities, you wanna make sure that um, everyone's on the same page and there's a level of competency and confidence that they have in the process. Um, and so now we're at a point where there is more universal awareness of our new processes and um, with working very closely with the law department, we're looking at a continuum of penalties for non-compliance. Um, I will say that DNH paving, um, they did fairly well in their other goals, um, but the one thing that they were they they did well in was following our good faith efforts throughout the way and and working closely with us to do that. They did fall short of their apprenticeship requirement um, and they are going to be held accountable for that. Um, and the last thing uh, that, uh, that I would like to say is that we have been in very close contact with Amherst Paving and they have also been um, very cooperative uh, throughout this process and um, that they, they wanna make sure that they stay in compliance with our requirements. Thank you. And then finally, one last question. What is the penalty for non-compliance um, if they don't um, hire the apprentice um, and they complete the work and we find out afterwards that they weren't compliant? Is there a financial penalty? Is, uh, do we recapture any of the money? I'm going to let Anna Falikoff from the law department comment on that. She's on mute. Uh, I could, thanks, Shatora. Um, uh, Councilmember Rivera, that's something that we're actively looking into. Unfortunately, the apprenticeship law 
only provides for the termination of the contract, which after the fact is not a very useful penalty. Um, you know, our, we're in the process of determining an appropriate penalty to hold DNH accountable for its failure to, to meet the apprenticeship requirement. Um, it will likely be a, a type of percentage of retention and as Shatora stated, a continuum so that contractors are on notice that failure to comply um, will result in, in, in consequences. Um, so we'll be uh, reviewing that and coming back before the council to get your input and your approval on that enforcement process and procedure. Thank you. Matt Kent with a follow-up. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I do want to echo that the, uh, the regulatory framework that the city has established thus far is laudable. Uh, there are a lot of safeguards, there are a lot of checks, uh, there's a lot of balances, and the law sets a laudably high bar, whereas many uh, apprentice programs can slip through the cracks just by existing on paper, the city rightfully requires the employment of apprentices, which sets it apart, unfortunately, from many municipalities that facilitate paper programs. Uh, one of the programs I did want to highlight is the one utilized by DNH Paving, uh, that is, uh, let's get it right here, the Empire State Merit Alliance, the Empire State Merit Apprenticeship Alliance. Uh, this program, as of 2017, the most recent year for which we have data, the Merit Alliance had 73 participating contractors. Uh, that same year, it reported 29 active apprentices. That's less than half an apprentice per contractor. <laughs> and that's actually substantially better than many other years where it was even worse with less than uh, one apprentice for every 10 contractors. So I, I do wanna, uh, I, th I think some of the go along get along may be due to also a misunderstanding of the apprenticeship programs we're dealing with. Uh, many low road contractors uh, are not indeed utilizing well-reputed and well-established programs. Indeed, the truth is these programs in many cases do not exist to train workers, provide opportunity, create safe work sites and create safe work sites and build skills, they do not. They exist to satisfy contracting requirement in the barest, cheapest, thinnest, most meager sense possible. So I appreciate the high bar that the city has set. And I, both that the council set through law and then that the administration has set through regulations promulgated. Unfortunately for all of that, the only thing missing is the will to implement and utilize that and all the safeguards in the world will not be sufficient should the requirement to submit the needed ATP 123, New York State AT10, the required apprenticeship waiver form, the monthly compliance voucher, all of these that have been set forth and required, if they are not being submitted and they are not being scrutinized for failure to submit, the situation will only get worse. The non-compliance inaction invites non-compliance. So thank you everyone for the concerted efforts to resolve this situation. I, I am greatly optimistic. Okay, thank you. The motion is to table, seconded by council member Golombek. Item number eight, contractor documentation of apprenticeship quotas. Item is open. Mr. Chair, I, I don't have to speak on it. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I don't need to speak on this because I, I spoke on it at the, in the last item, we already have voted on it. So it is what is required. Um, the commissioner is on, he's aware of it. Um, uh, Attorney Donovan is on, she's aware of it. So it is policy now. Uh, that this is, will be what the what the council will do. So this was, I believe, we just sent the remainder. So this can be received and filed since the council has already voted on it. Motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file, seconded by Council President Priggen. Mr. Chair, if you wouldn't mind, there's another item related to this as well. Would you like to deal with that at the same time too? Sure, call that item. Item number 11 for the clerks. Item number 11, review of worker training program laws for compliance enforcement. 
This item is open. Uh, what would you like to do with this item? Um, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to, or a majority leader, to um, just put that on the table. Let, let's give it time for them to work on um, that review of the program. Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Item number nine, availability of mental health professionals to Buffalo Police Department. Items open. Again, Mr. Chairman, if we uh, can table that to give them time, um, I have been in conversation uh, with the administration of the plan uh, that they have right now um, and the council's desire of that plan to be um, all day, uh, all night. I know that there are some uh, who have uh, who have some concerns, but we've heard from and just in talking to the administration of the day and some of the phone calls that I've gotten from both sides. Uh, you have some people who do not want to who do not feel mental health professionals should respond with police. You have others who have contacted me who said I'm not going to go uh, without there being some level, uh, especially in the middle of the night of some protection. I want to be clear of where I'm at. So I, I really don't care how that occurs. Um, at the end of the day, what we have heard from this community, uh, where I don't think we need to be sidetracked and, and all of a sudden not do it at all, uh, either one of them, uh, based on which side doesn't want to do it with police, which side wants to show up by themselves. I, I've said this publicly. My concern is, are we going to have someone that is able to respond rapidly uh, to a mental health situation that is local, that can get there, and will will uh, they be willing uh, to go to a, a more challenged neighborhood at one o'clock in the morning by themselves? I can tell you this, um, some have said absolutely not. And I think it's up to whomever decides to be involved in this project. But I, I do believe that um, the overall goal uh, needs to be fulfilled, and that is to have mental health professionals uh, on that are able uh, to respond to certain situations. That is what the call from the community is. That is what seems to make sense. How they get to that, I, the devil is in the details and they just have to work through it. I have no opinion one way or the other, whether they should be embedded, whether they should be out. This talks about being embedded. The mayor has talked about being embedded. If there's another way to do it, let's do it. My concern is, is that we end up doing nothing because one side disagrees with the, the method. You gotta do something and hopefully they'll be able to work that out. Um, so for this item, and there may be other people to speak on this, um, I would ask that we do not, uh, that we table this so that this stays before us until it's worked out. Okay, council member Wingo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, of course, I, I, this is an, uh, a subject that I have done some, just a little bit of research on. I'm not claiming to be a clinician or an expert or a social worker or a behavioral health or mental health expert, but I do have colleagues and good friends who advise me and send me uh, peer reviewed articles to help me understand better uh, the, the need for data driven uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, so that's the co-responder model uh, that's been used in the Boston Police Department. Now, however they go about doing this, however they go about implementing this program, again, there is a concern for the safety of the uh, behavioral health specialist as well as the person who may be publicly uh, decompos decomposing. So we want to make sure uh, that we have everyone uh, using data-driven uh, evidence-based practices. And that's what this is, using quantitative correspondent data to ensure that uh, uh, the work that's being done is not just based on how folks feel about the situation, but this is something that is data-driven, evidence-based. Uh, the article is peer-reviewed. Uh, quantitative and both qualitative research has been uh, conducted uh, to that effect. So when the Buffalo Police uh, Department uh, uh, chooses to share with us their implementation of this program, I'm hoping that they can also provide for us some data analysis on how they've come to the conclusion that they're going to use this various, the, 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 this particular framework uh, to execute that model. So other than that, I'm hoping that we have a very in-depth and substantive conversation. But again, uh, you know, the devil may be in the details. 
but just playing devil's advocate, we do need to make sure that we pay attention to those details uh, because those details do matter. And those little details may be the difference between someone's life uh, or death. So we need to make sure that we're doing everything intentionally and deliberately as we move forward, uh, integrating a behavioral uh, health piece into how Buffalo police respond to these calls. Now, one more thing, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your opportunity to allow me to speak. Uh, one more thing though, too, we have to understand that there are already, uh, there is already a system in place for folks to call to get mental health response. There is a phone number for you to call. I don't have it handy with me right now, but they made a presentation to ensure that we are aware that there is already currently uh, a system in place to risk for folks to call in when you see someone uh, who may be having a mental health crisis. Uh, but we want to make sure that again, this is intentional and deliberate. It's data driven. Uh, and, and, and as far as the report out to the council, uh, we were looking forward to the data and how the data is informing their decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the uh, time. Thank you. Council member Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to remind the council, you know, I think we're doing a lot of things piecemeal. I mean, I know we're responding to the residents, but initially our thoughts were to put forth resolutions that this committee that the mayor was supposed to put forth to discuss these things and kind of do the due diligence for them so that we're not doing this. Um, right now, we supposedly have a plan in place, but where was that plan on the incident of last Sunday? Um, again, I think we're being sidetracked and we've put things in place. We've asked for a good legislation, but we really wanted that committee to do a lot of the vetting and out of the legwork um, to get those things to, to, to bring them back to us so that we could have a comprehensive plan. Is this not something us reacting to something that has happened? And I'm hopeful, I know I heard on the news the other day that this committee is supposed to be seated. And I'm really hopeful that they are because I think again, we've put forth ideas and object and opinions but we do need them to be vetted. I know council president is probably getting a number of calls. I got a couple of calls from people who don't agree currently what we're trying to do, but we're just trying to respond to the people to make sure that we have something in place. Um, but again, I think that committee could be very, very helpful in kind of looking at some of the details in which we can put something that's comprehensive in place that is just not something that we have a knee jerk reaction to, to but there's something that's well thought out um, so again, I'm hopeful that that committee comes forward to kind of address these issues a little bit with a little bit more detail and than what we're doing right now. Because again, there's people coming from all sorts of side, all sides with this issue, some disagreeing, some agreeing, um, but we just want to make sure we get it right because people's lives are on the line. This is a critical issue. We know that the community, the advocates and people have been coming out in droves about this particular issue. And I'm just very concerned that another incident will occur and we'll be back here going back and forth and not really having a solid plan in place to make sure that we can, again, save lives and protect our officers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Council Member Wingo. Yes, real quick. The number to crisis services is 716-834-3131. I don't wanna just talk about the structure that's already in place and not give the folks who are watching an opportunity to actually contact them. The number again is 716-834-3131. That is crisis services and they are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that number. We're going to council member Bowman then council member Golombek. Just quickly, I wanted to mention that uh, Jessica Pirro uh, from crisis services will be in our next meeting at two o'clock to kind of give us um, some input on the incident that occurred with Mr. Henley uh, a couple of weeks ago, and also um, the things that they do because they're involved with a CIT training for our Buffalo police officers. But she sent us a letter and an email regarding some of the things um, in her professional input on what's happening and some ideas for moving forward, like having the 911 operators trained to know to call crisis services in some situations instead of forwarding a lower level call to the police. Uh, so just kind of prefacing the next meeting, we'll have some, some input from a mental health professional. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Golombek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanna just start out by saying that, you know, unfortunately in general, we are reacting. Um, we're reacting to problems that are nationwide right now, 
Um, and in certain regards, it's not our fault um, because the reaction is something, you know, well, where were we six months ago prior to this? Um, I can tell you that some of us have been sitting down with the mayor and have been meeting with him for many, many years uh, discussing things like the chokeholds. We knew that the chokehold had been uh, stopped being taught at the academy years ago, um, changes on the SWAT team and things like that. Um, but to make meaningful and long uh, term changes in the police department are going to be, as my two colleagues, uh, Mr. Pridgen and Mr. Wingo stated, the details and the devil is going to be in those details. Um, if we immediately respond and react to things, I'm afraid that we're going to try to come up with a solution that is much worse than the problem. Uh, a month ago, everyone was cl clamoring or many people were clamoring for healthcare professionals, social workers to address these issues that the police are currently responding to. Now I have had emails and I have spoken to people that have said to me, I will not go on a call with the police department because they go in there with a more aggressive stance and it's not appropriate. I've had uh, social workers as well tell me, I will not go on any of these calls without having police with me. Um, each side, when I have spoken to them, seems to have legitimate reasons. I think one side is a little bit more political, to be quite honest with you, than the other side. And I don't really care about one's political agenda. I care about what is safest for everyone, the officers, the victims, the uh, social workers, et cetera. And, you know, this is not something I don't think that we're going to be able to, uh, to figure out in one week. And if we do, we should market it all across the country. And it's not just Buffalo that is unique in this situation. But I think that, you know, we have to take a very, very serious look at this and figure out what the outcomes, what are the outcomes that we want and what are the outcomes that can potentially happen. Um, so I want to commend my colleagues for taking a very, very deep look at this and trying to come up with real adequate solutions. But as you mentioned, and I agree, the devil is in the details. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion is to table by Majority Leader Rivera, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item number 10, local law, intro number one, Carriel's law, the duty to intervene. Items open. This item is open. It was sponsored by Council President Pridgen. Council President. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and to my colleagues um, who unanimously sent this forward to get to this point. Um, this is a, the, as, as the public knows, and as all of my colleagues know, uh, they have um, the law in front of them. They have been presented the law. Um, I said in the council meeting, uh, my thanks uh, again to our corporation council for churning this out with a great deal of community input. Um, as council member Golombek was saying on the last item, you know, we are reacting. We're reacting to the um, reality of the day. Um, and I appreciate that comment because at the end of the day, uh, this is something that many people, including myself, Carriel's Law, felt was very important uh, to, to happen. And I think all of my colleagues felt that a duty to intervene law was the right thing uh, to do. I, I don't remember hearing one of them saying that they didn't. Um, at the end of the day, it is before us. It is tabled, it um, has received, and I don't know, well, yeah, I'm sure council staff is on. Um, have we received anything else in writing uh, concerning the law, the draft of the law that is before us? And Mr. President, we don't have any communications on that this time. All right, so this um, has to age, uh, had to age for two weeks. It, um, if there are no objections from this committee, uh, would go to the full council, I believe, um, without recommendation, if I'm right, Corporation Council, because that next this week would be another of the of the two weeks. Um, yes, you can send it with or without recommendation. At the end of the day, it wouldn't be able to be passed fully until next week. 
So it so this could uh, definitely be passed next week. Um, um, at at the end of the day, I think that the community has worked very hard. Um, Corporation Council has worked very hard to incorporate those portions of the legislation that were suggested that could legally be put into this document. Um, and I think that's what uh, some may not understand at times. Uh, we cannot make a law to break a law. So we can't make a law that breaks uh, state law or federal law or goes against the Constitution of the United States. Um, and so that work has been done. This is before us. Um, and those are my comments. And uh, hopefully uh, we will agree to send this to the full committee for a vote on next Tuesday. Thank you. Motion to send without recommendation. Motion is to send without recommendation, seconded by Council President Pridgen. We already addressed item number 11. So if you can call items 12 and 12, please. Item 12, amend zoning map for 259, 267, 352 Mystic. Motion to table items 12 and 13. Seconded by council member Scanlon. Take from the table items 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 35. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Item 16, special use permit 1221 Lovejoy for tavern and outdoor dining and live entertainment and N3C season. All right, thank you. Before we get to the 17 public hearings that we have coming up, I would just like to remind everyone um, the rules of this committee are limiting everyone to three minutes. So if you can please keep that in mind, I'd rather not cut someone off right when they're at the three minutes. So if you can please keep that in mind and we'll start with this item. Motion of the public hearing. Seconded by council member Bowman. Is anyone here to speak on 1221 Lovejoy? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Council President, uh, members of the Council, Corey Auerbach from Barclay Damon, on behalf of the applicant, Cataragus Brewing Company. Uh, Cataragus Brewing is making significant investment in the Lovejoy district, including its purchase and redevelopment of 1221 Lovejoy into a tavern. Uh, which we're envisioning to be a great community amenity in this area of Lovejoy, which is uh, commercial in nature. We did appear before the planning board and received a unanimous recommendation for the special use permits that we're requesting with conditions. As was stated, we're asking for special use permits for live entertainment. This will be uh, music that will be incidental to the tavern use. Uh, it is intended to help attract people to the facility for uh, to enjoy the food and beverage that will be provided there. It is not a concert venue by any means. It is merely incidental live music that uh, is intended to help attract customers to the business. We're also requesting outdoor dining. Uh, now more than ever, the need for outdoor dining um, has really been driven home. A portion of the property uh, was, was demolished to make way for a beautiful outdoor patio area which we have included in our application for liquor license, which has been approved by the State Liquor Authority. And finally, the, the tavern use, which requires a special use permit. This was an existing tavern uh, that was purchased by the applicant and is now being redeveloped, including uh, substantial renovation to the second floor, which will be incorporated into the business, um, mostly uh, arising from the need to provide for social distancing during this unusual time. Um, as I noted, we were approved subject to conditions. Um, those conditions are mostly satisfactory to the applicant, including the hours of operation, which are till 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, tables to be bussed from the inside and no outside trash receptacles. A condition was suggested by the planning board that there not be any outside music permitted. We are hopeful that uh, we could be approved in some limited nature to have some outdoor music, non-amplified music, 
um, just again to uh, create a certain ambiance on the patio for people that are enjoying food and beverage in that area. Um, we have had community outreach. Um, we've, we've spoken with the community association. We had a generally warm reception to the proposal. We've also uh, appreciate the leadership from the district council member Bowman, who we've also been in close contact with. And in respect for the number of hearings that you still have to go through and the, the time of this meeting, I will uh, be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Council Member Bowman. Yes. Uh, thank you, Corey, uh, for your presentation. We do have um, Jill from the Lovejoy Village Association that would like to make a comment. So at this point, I'll allow her to make her comments and uh, withhold mine until after. Thank you. Jill, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jill Stabler. I am the Vice President of the Lovejoy Village Association, a longtime resident of Lovejoy, and I own a home very close to where they are um, redoing this tavern. Our issue isn't with the tavern or the outdoor dining. It is with the live music. We have had um, special use permits given before where they were non-compliant. And we're just concerned that, you know, that may happen here. And we just want to be very um, forthcoming that, you know, they're, behind this is residential homes. And their backyard where their outdoor dining and live music would be does butt up against other people's backyards. And, you know, if, if people are, don't like it, we're the ones who are going to get all the complaints and all of that. So we just want to make sure that, you know, it's not going to be, you know, some Metallica cover band that's going to be, you know, playing and, you know, some kind of like, you know, is it dining music like jazz or is, you know, what are we referring to as far as live music is concerned? Thanks, Jill. Uh, is that, that your full comment? Yeah, well, that and we have, um, you know, we just opened up a, a art studio, which is two doors away. You know, we have kids coming in and out. You know, we have kids there at minimum three times a week. So it's a little concerning as far as, you know, the kind of people who would be coming in if they're going to be hanging out, out in the front of the tavern. 100%. Mm -hmm. Corey, could you uh, speak to, um, you know, what exactly you would envision on the patio as far as music? So are we uh, we're not talking about loud bands here, right? We're talking more, um, you know, stereo music. That's exactly right. This is going to be an absolutely state-of-the-art um, tavern restaurant that uh, my client is very excited about. Uh, Cataraga's Brewing and Carousel Development Company, as the, the district council member is aware, has made seven-figure investments in this neighborhood and is really trying to lift up the community, not bring it down. So any music will be strictly incidental to its dining operations. We don't anticipate any rock you know, concerts, loud music. It's merely to attract customers to the business, to bring people into the community, and as an incentive for people to come and enjoy food and beverage. As I noted, the, the music is, is really just to bring people in so that they can enjoy a nice dining experience it's, it's a difficult time for restaurants, as we're all aware. So this is just another opportunity to help bring people to the Lovejoy community. But Jill, your, your concerns are well-placed. They are, they are heard. Um, we have provided contact information to the district council member. And, and I know that you've been in contact with my client and we'll provide contact information for you. Last thing my client wants is for um, there to be any negative impacts from, from their proposal. So if you do receive any calls or issues, we will have a number for you so that you can immediately contact directly to the management to make sure that those uh, concerns are addressed. But specifically, no, this is not, uh, as you noted, Metallica type concerts outside. <laughs> any music outside will be um, acoustic. It will be incidental to the dining experience. And um, this is really designed to bring people in to bring up this area of Lovejoy, not to bring it down. And, and we can stipulate uh, conditions that uh, speak directly to the type of music that will be played. Because um, as Jill mentioned, Corey, in the past, we have had some 
some businesses that were approved that had no respect for the neighborhood or quality of life. Uh, but that is not the, uh, the feeling I have with, um, with the meeting I've had with you and, you know, Bill and uh, Vince have been very, uh, you know, accommodating. He, we, I walked through the building. I think the plans are great for the building. I'm excited. Um, so we 100% hear you, Jill, and we'll make sure that the, uh, the conditions are set so everybody's agreeable um, at that point. Moving forward. Thank you. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Motion to approve with conditions set by the Council Member. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Thank you. Item number 17, adaptive reuse permit 23 Agassiz Circle for professional offices. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. This item, I know Paul Becker is here to speak on this. This property is located at 23 Agassiz. Um, it was owned by Canisius College for several decades, I believe, and used as office space. It was listed, um, it was listed for sale for a bit. And it's my understanding that Mr. Becker, you want to convert that building or keep it into offices? Yeah, yes, uh, uh, Chairman, I want to use it for the exact same purposes that's been used now. I'm actually the purchaser, potential purchaser of that building. My concern was when I went to buy it, Canisius had it listed as a commercial building, which I think they naturally thought it was because they used it for an office type setting since 2005. Um, I am not an educational facility and it's zoned NR3, so my concern was under that, would I be able to use it in the same manner? I do not want to make any changes to this building whatsoever. I want to use it in the exact same manner that it's been used for the last 15 years. Um, the sale of the building is contingent upon um, this adaptive reuse permit being granted. The um, It's interesting that uh, um, uh, you know, Canisius, they're actually willing to even hold the mortgage in order to make this go forth because uh, even though lending was difficult, the commercial lenders didn't want to lend because of the residential aspects and the, and the residential lenders didn't want to lend because of the commercial aspects. So this is really a great way to get this thing back active, back on the tax rolls, um, get some use out of it. And I really don't want to do anything different with the building than what's been done for the last decade and a half. Okay, great. Um, is there anyone else to speak on this? Uh, my name is Tom Simonelli. I'm the director of facilities with Canisius College. And I just wanted to let you know that we have been using that as an administrative office building since we acquired it, as uh, Mr. Becker said. And we support, uh, obviously, um, his quest to continue that use and, um, um, and, and put that property back on the tax rolls. Okay, anyone else? Motion to close public hearing. Motion to close public hearing, seconded by Council Member Bowman. Motion to approve, seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Item 18, zoning map amendment 1019 Clinton from DIH to DIL zone. Motion to open public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Good, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah, my name is Byron Brewer. I'm the CPA for the applicant. And on September 8th, we got the motion for the rezoning. And now the applicant is looking to have an opportunity to sell used cars on, on the property. We got the sign off from uh, council member Noah Kowski. The applicant made some improvements, putting up a new gate, putting parking spaces in front of the building. And I was just looking to, uh, to get city approval for the allowance for used vehicle sales. And he, he'll have up to no more than 10 vehicles on display at a time. And um, the hours will be from 8 a.m to 6 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, yes, I did meet with Mr. Brewer and I do have to say uh, working with him has been 
uh, great. He, the applicant has made significant changes to the, uh, the exterior of their building by upgrading security and uh, fencing and lighting and making sure that it's aesthetically pleasing. And I will motion to approve this with conditions um, to be stated on the record that there will be no more than 10 um, vehicles in the front for display and for the hours of operation to be Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Councilmember Nowakowski. Motion to approve with conditions. Seconded by Councilmember Nowakowski. Item 19. Special use permit 1084 Elmwood for non-owner occupied short-term rental and M2C zone. Motion open to public hearing. Seconded by council member Wyatt. Is the owner of 1084 Elmwood here? Okay, then we will uh, close the public hearing and send it without recommendation. Motion to close public hearing, send it without rec. Seconded by council member Scanlon. Item number 20, special use permit 44 Brayton for live entertainment in N2E zone. Motion open to public hearing. Seconded by council member Scanlon. Hello. Um, uh, all right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah, my name's Kevin Gardner. I, uh, my wife and I own the property. Uh, and at Five Points Bakery, and we're looking to get a special use permit to allow for live entertainment. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I have been in this neighborhood for 20 years now, and um, we've, uh, when we first opened our bakery, uh, we have, we were trying to really bring the neighborhood back to life. Um, and it was at that time, there was a lot of barbed wire, a lot of glass block, a lot of crime. Um, and <laughs> we um, opened our bakery in the neighborhood where we live to try and create an environment where people could meet and it would start to bring some life back. And uh, over the last 11 years that we've been working on this, um, if you've come down to five points, um, you can see what a dramatic transformation has taken place. Um, and I wanted to reach out and thank Dave Rivera, uh, my council member for all the help he's given us over the years. Um, and for even showing up to the community meetings that we had on this item in the rain, he was out there um, talking to us in the neighborhood. Um, and this uh, special use permit um, will allow us to bring an element of vibrancy into the intersection. We have so much, so we have 13 businesses now in that area. Um, and there was just Urban Roots and me not too long ago. And we'll be able to have, um, uh, uh, we have a large property of acre of land and we have uh, small events like birthday parties and things like that. And that allow us to be able to develop that a little bit more. And uh, in our front yard where we put uh, our outdoor dining, um, it'll allow us to have Buffalo Jazz Collective reached out to us. Um, they wanted to perform and that, and, um, and that kind of was the impetus for me moving forward with this now. Um, I had planned on doing this next year, but um, with COVID, a lot of these uh, professional musicians aren't allowed to play indoors. And so um, we're moving forward with this now. And um, we, uh, we really think it's something, we reached out to all the immediate businesses, got their support. Um, we went door to door to all the neighbors that are around. Um, and we, we haven't had any opposition. A few of the neighbors that were concerned, their concerns were um, things that we expected, um, parking and noise. Um, and so we, we did due diligence reaching out to places nearby that had large parking areas um, in case we did have an event where there was a need for extra parking um, to accommodate for that. And then the, you know, the noise where the planning board had suggested a hours of operation 11 and midnight on weekends, but we actually suggested that we reduce that um, we have a family in this and live in this area and 11 o'clock on a weekday is your kids should be in bed before then if they're going to school the next day. So um, we want to uh, have it shut down 10 o'clock during the week and 11 o'clock on the weekends. 
and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. All right, if there's no questions, comments, I'll go to Majority Leader Rivera, whose district this is in. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to commend Kevin Gardner for the work that he's done over at Five Points. Um, he mentioned 13 businesses that have opened up in that area, but he's the trailblazer. A lot of those businesses are there because he invested in the neighborhood and he is well respected. As a matter of fact, many people came out in the rain to support this project. I was there as well. Um, and I'm glad to hear you say that you're gonna close earlier than what the planning board had recommended. So that's definitely a plus. Uh, thank you very much for all you do. Uh, now, when we met, there was a concern about uh, putting a sunset of one year. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we're going to revisit this next year. And I'm certain based on your track record of working with the neighborhood um, and the people around the neighborhood that um, there will be no problems. So I'm going to approve. I'm going to recommend that we approve it, that we revisit this in one year uh, because of the noise. Uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that just based on the, how you work with the neighbors in in the past, that there will be no problem. So uh, motion is to approve with conditions um, that I'll set. Um, good luck on on the entertainment. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, David Rivera. I really appreciate it. The motion is to approve with conditions seconded by Council Member Scanlon, and I just want to congratulate you. I think this will be great. Occasionally, when I leave the Delaware District, I go to Five Points, and you've done such a phenomenal job over there. So good luck with, with everything you're doing in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do think you need a motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to approve with conditions. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. We have been joined by the applicant for number 19. I don't know if you want to go back or continue. Uh, do you want to revisit item number 19? Motion, there is a motion to revisit item 19, seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Item number 19, 1084 Elmwood. Motion to reopen. Motion to reopen, seconded by Council Member Wyatt. This is an application, I believe, for a short-term rental. If you can just give us a brief summary of what you're doing. I know you put a lot of work into the building and it looks better than it ever has, but if you can give us a brief update, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Uh, my name is Christine Fisher. I, I work with Jennifer. She was unable to make it today. Um, we are just wanting to use the upper unit of the building for short-term rentals, Airbnb. She recently remodeled the whole building. Typico Cafe is in the lower part. Um, and just going forward, we'd like to have somewhere for tourists to come and stay and uh, offer that in the city of Buffalo. Okay, and this is on Elmwood Avenue. So it's, it's, on, a, it's on a commercial street. Um, yep. So when we, when we were doing the Airbnb legislation, we talked about having uh, a special use permit required when it's non-owner occupied and it's on a commercial street. So we certainly appreciate that. Is there anyone else here to speak on this? Okay, so the previous motion was to send without recommendation. We'll change that motion to approve. Motion to rescind the previous motion. Motion is now to approve. Okay, seconded by council, President Pridgen. Thank you. Item 21, special use permit 1376 Kensington for neighborhood shop, beauty salon and N3R zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by council member Wyatt. Anyone here to speak on this item? Yes, this is Anthony James architect for the owner, Rose Hussain. Okay, Anthony, go ahead. So we have a uh, legacy commercial space here in a residential zone, uh, N3R zone. 
The uh, building has had a uh, commercial storefront since uh, uh, probably the 1920s. Uh, it has been vacant for over a year. Therefore, we need to uh, ask for a special use permit to reestablish a business in the existing storefront. So uh, the owner uh, will be opening a beauty salon there. Uh, and if, uh, if you looked through the uh, material, you'll see that there uh, are a number of commercial uses in the immediate neighborhood this is Kensington Avenue just before you get to Eggert. So at Eggert, of course, there's a Tim Hortons, there's a shopping plaza, there's a gas station. And then uh, heading back uh, towards the city uh, at the next uh, intersection, heading west, there is a convenience store uh, and there are several non-conforming commercial uses uh, in that block uh, as well. So uh, we're asking for the special use permit to allow reestablishing a, a business there. Okay, uh, Council Member Wyatt. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. James, I have not spoke to the applicant. However, I did um, walk in that neighborhood and talk to a few of the neighbors and none of them had a problem. Um, I was concerned about the parking, but it's only a hair salon. There's no space to park in the driveway because that's kind of cut off. Um, right. But it is a commercial on a commercial strip. So I really don't have a problem with it, but I would like to talk to the applicant just to get some more details as far as the times and those things, because she is very close to neighbors. It's not like there's any space between her and her next door neighbor. So I would like to just have a conversation to see if she's talked to them. Um, yeah. but I did talk to yeah. two of the neighbors, but they weren't right adjacent to the salon. Uh, so I might mention that we did have a neighborhood meeting. We, uh, and uh, you know, we had let your office know about that meeting. We distributed flyers within a 300 foot radius. Uh, and we had uh, two people come to the meeting. One was the neighbor uh, immediately to the east who uh, had no objections and uh, the other attendee other than the owner was the owner's brother. And of course he supported his sister. Uh, but uh, uh, from that attendance, I would say that yes, there, there's uh, likely uh, no objection in the community. Yeah, to I, reestablishing I, this. Okay, I don't have a problem with it, but if you could please have her give our office a call because I don't remember the meeting date or time, but definitely like to talk to her, we'll talk to the advocates, I don't know if it's him or her, um, but um, I don't have a problem with it. And I know that one of the residents said um, he supported it because we need more businesses. So yeah. I definitely don't have a problem with it. So I wanna send it without wreck and if she can give the applicant, have the applicant give my office a call, like to touch base. Yes, uh, I'll definitely do that. Okay, thank you, sir. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Motion to sound without recommendation. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Item 22, special use permit 1367 Delaware for outdoor dining in N2C zone. Motion open a public hearing. Um, the It looks like the motion is now to receive. To receive and file. Yes, seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item 23, special use permit 1025 Fillmore for neighborhood shop grocery store in N3R zone. Motion open a public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. I believe Mr. James is here. Yes, for this uh, item. Anthony James, uh, again, uh, the architect for this project. Uh, this is a block uh, on Fillmore Avenue, which is uh, one block south of Genesee Street. So if you're familiar with the neighborhood at, at Genesee, at the corner of Genesee, there's a dollar store. Across Genesee, there's a Rite Aid. Uh, there's a, a commercial use on the south uh, 
southwest corner of Genesee and then coming down Fillmore on the west side of the street, there are a number of commercial uses there. Uh, this is on the east side of the street. It's a short block with four buildings in it. All four uh, originally had storefronts in them. Uh, I came before uh, council last year and planning board on 1015 Fillmore, which is two doors away uh, for a special use permit because it is an N3R zone. Uh, and so we received the special use permit to reestablish commercial use in that building. So uh, this building is similarly has a storefront which uh, uh, wraps around the corner there. And uh, the last use in the building was a candy shop. Uh, so uh, my client will be reestablishing commercial, commercial use on the first floor uh, with a grocery store that uh, also has a commercial kitchen and uh, some eat-in restaurant space. So it is again reestablishing uh, uh, commercial use that always existed uh, in this building and until the, uh, the candy shop uh, uh, closed and it's been vacant ever since. So again, we also held a public meeting here. Uh, we uh, were in conversation with Mr. Nowakowski's office and for this one, uh, again, we distributed flyers in a 300 foot radius. No one showed up to this meeting. So uh, it is uh, very much an edge condition for uh, the N3R zone in that location. So we would uh, like to request your uh, approval for uh, the special use permit to allow the uh, commercial use to be reestablished. Okay, Councilmember Nowakowski. Is there anyone else is here to speak on this item? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can okay, you... Becky, go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, this is Becky Powell. I'm here with um, um, Carla Amorosi. We are the owners of 1032 Fillmore. It's a former firehouse that we purchased. Uh, we've been uh, have had an architect come up with a plan for that. We're putting in uh, some apartments in that building. So we're spending uh, considerable resources to develop that property and to create uh, housing that will hopefully add to the neighborhood. And we understand that those already commercial things in the neighborhood, um, clearly that is there, but there are already two markets on the same block as our building, which is directly across from the street from uh, 1025 Fillmore, and uh, we already have the dollar store, the Rite Aid, and not, not far from um, our property down south of Genesee. It's a very intact neighborhood. There's a lot of well cared for homes, a lot of um, homeowners that are living in their homes, not a lot of rental properties, so they're well taken care of. And we also, um, Councilman Rivera is familiar with me. I also um, own properties on the west side and we have corner stores as they're like, as they're called uh, all over the west side. And although I won't paint a broad picture and say all of them are bad, I certainly think that there are some issues with corner stores that, that seem to be endemic. And we've run into that on the west side. And as a matter of fact, there's one just at the end of my block. And we have a lot of problems with loitering and uh, they have lo giant lights on there, light pollution that's on all the time. Uh, there's trash up and down the block from people coming to that store, uh, always cars parked in front. Um, and, and I believe uh, not always activity that's legal. So we're concerned about that because we are really, it's really important for us to improve this neighborhood. Um, we love that neighborhood and we would like to see it be as intact as possible as a residential neighborhood. And being that our, our experience has not been great with corner stores, uh, we would be very concerned about this um, special permit being approved. Uh, we did not receive a flyer at our, uh, we are a firehouse, an old firehouse, so possibly that didn't make it to our door, but however, we did not receive a flyer. Certainly, we would have attended any other meetings. So we're here today just to put uh, all of this out there that we are very concerned about the addition of another 
use that's already in the neighborhood. There's already four essentially markets that you can buy food at within the same block. We're not opposed to commercial development, but we, certainly we would like to see something that would be of some a different source of commercial, just like in the five points where we're near, there's lots of different things, lots, and I think it really makes up for a vibrant neighborhood as opposed to just having repetitive commercial businesses that may or may not add to the neighborhood and frankly may um, drag it down. There's been a lot of work done on the east side to really make it a better place for everyone. And we're trying to be a part of that. And so our concern would be that this isn't part of the larger plan that everyone has for, for improving Buffalo and improving this neighborhood in particular, so. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Councilmember Nowakowski? Yeah, I think, you know, when we had a meeting, I think, Tony, it might have been, I remember it being cold, it might have been in December, um, you were able to articulate a lot of the plans that, that this would not be a corner store, that would be more of a grocer, um, and that it would, you know, there was significant differences, because I did, you know, on the east side, I, 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 we don't need any more, you know, necessarily corner stores that are selling alcohol or tobacco or and stuff like that, but that this would be more of like a cultural grocer. Um, and, you know, the, I do know that, because I work with you on a, on a lot of them, Tony, but that the gentleman is going, that lives above it. It's the one where he converted, um, I think, two apartments into a, almost a single family residence where he's living um, with his children. Um, if you can elaborate a little bit more just to refresh my memory. Yeah, yes. So Mitch, that was uh, the meeting we held for 1015 Fillmore. So that, that was recently. 1015 Fillmore uh, is owned by the gentleman who runs a store several doors away from the firehouse, uh, which is one of the stores that Becky uh, referenced. Uh, he is going to be moving his store across the street when they finish the uh, renovation of that building, which uh, will have uh, a residential use on the second floor. The one that we're talking about now, 1025 Fillmore, uh, I, I might mention that both, both these gentlemen know each other. They live in the neighborhood. They're members of the Bangladeshi community. There will be no alcohol sales. Uh, there will be uh, uh, culturally uh, appropriate products that, that are uh, sold there. So, you know, it's, it's not the sort of corner store apparently that uh, uh, the firehouse owners have experienced on the west side, but uh, this is definitely uh, a store that uh, is owned and run by people in the neighborhood who are concerned as well uh, about uh, developing this area and uh, you know ha having things be uh, appropriate. Uh, we can certainly uh, talk about the lighting uh, as we haven't gotten to building permit drawings yet. Uh, at the present time, we have not discussed any sort of bright lights outside. Uh, like I say, the storefront wraps around the building uh, on two sides because there is the side street there. And uh, uh, with green code uh, requirements for glass area, you know, we have to have 70% glass on the front, 40% glass on the, the side wall. So there will be a lot of storefront there, but, uh, you know, I, I can certainly say that that we would uh, not have floodlights outside or, or anything like that. And I, I can also offer, uh, Becky, that we would uh, be able to meet with you and uh, say, uh, meet with members of the, the council member's office. And uh, uh, I, I'm sorry you did not receive one of the flyers. They were distributed. Uh, but but we're certainly Good happy. Idea. Council member Nowakowski, you. did you have your hand up? Thank you. Yeah, you, um, I would like to do just that because when I I felt really com I felt comfortable when um, we first met that this was this store would be a, more of a cultural store and sell cultural items um, instead of the any remnants of, of food store items that we're we're used to seeing. 
and that I do appreciate, Tony, if we could work on adequate lighting, because I think Becky brings up a good point that um, we don't want floodlights or, or, or something that's going to be obtrusive, right. especially if they're doing wonderful work and in, in putting but probably wonderful apartments in that um, adaptive reuse of a firehouse. So if we could connect, I know there's council staff um, on this call, if council staff connect, connect Becky, myself, myself and my office with Tony so we can um, mitigate any of these concerns, I think that, that we can move on a positive path. Okay, so is this, uh, are you going to- You could do a motion uh, without recommendation. recommendation. Yeah, until we work all this out, yep. Motion to close public hearing. Motion to close public hearing, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to send without recommendation. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item 24, special use permit 413 Sherman for assembly church in N3R zone. Motion open to public hearing. Seconded by Council President Pridgen. Anyone here to speak on this item? Yes, uh, Anthony James. This is uh, another project. Said, on, three in a row. Yeah, uh, another project I'm the architect for. Uh, 413 Sherman is the site of the former Salem Evangelical Church. Uh, a wonderful church building that unfortunately uh, had been let uh, go to the point where it had to be demolished by the city in uh, 2017. Uh, however, the church tower was structurally sound and a group of interested citizens uh, were able to uh, work with the city to save the tower and uh, this new church, uh, which is called uh, New Alliance Assembly, uh, was able to then uh, purchase the property and they wish to construct a new church building. Uh, they are an immigrant congregation with a small budget at the moment, but they are very happy that there is this church tower on the property and while the uh, uh, the proposed new sanctuary building won't connect immediately. Uh, there is a plan uh, in the future to then connect the new sanctuary to the tower. So uh, again, we had a uh, neighborhood meeting for this project, uh, distributed the flyers in the 300 foot radius. We had three people uh, come to the meeting uh, who were all from the immediate neighborhood and they had no objections to reestablishing a church on this property. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council President Pridgen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the a meeting, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to be there. Um, the, we have had correspondence from um, at least one neighbor who was concerned uh, because it is now residential, I, I do believe it was re, um, in the green coat. Yes, this is also zoned uh, N3R and therefore to have uh, uh, an assembly use such as a church, uh, it's uh, required to have a special use permit. Um, so there was some questioning about the parking and where would uh, parishioners park? Is there enough on that site? Yeah, yeah, so uh, the site plan that was included with uh, the package shows uh, the maximum amount of parking that we could fit on the site currently. Uh, there will also have to be some parking on the street. Uh, and I have encouraged the church to pursue purchasing uh, the adjacent lots between their property and Sycamore which are owned by the city so that they will be able to expand their parking there, which they are very much interested in doing. But at the present time, their, their budget uh, is strictly uh, concerned with, with getting the new building built. But uh, so, thank you. And um, the, so I, like I said, I've only received this one. Um, I, I am somewhat concerned about the tower. Um, I, I was concerned when it was left, 
uh, the residents, the immediate residents, uh, were concerned that that would not be a part of a new project as it was promised. Um, so I'm a little concerned to hear that we're just going to have a basically a tower uh, standing there alone um, without connecting to this new project. Why, why, why can it not be connected to the new project? Because that's what I was promised. Oh, well, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure who, who promised that, but in the our- You asked me to leave it up there because <laughs> the wrecking ball was ready to knock it down. Oh, uh, you- I was on site. On, I was literally on site. Um, and the question that was asked of me, do you want this to come down too? Um, I know that there were some people from the preservation community um, that wanted it up. I can tell you the neighbors did not want it up. So now we have in a residential neighborhood, basically a chimney uh, that is standing there by itself that in this plan, there is no plan to do anything with it. I, I don't know why we have that standing there. Uh, so uh, as I recall, this was a, uh, a preservation issue. The tower was not structurally compromised and uh, uh, there was a report prepared by a structural engineer which uh, uh, confirmed that. And so the preservation community uh, was able to save that tower. Uh, at present time, it's merely a budget issue, not to, uh, you know, there, there isn't a budget immediately to be able to connect the new structure with the uh, with the tower although that is the plan and that does show in the uh, the application materials there uh, there is uh, the indication there of the future construction connecting the two uh, if there is a serious concern with the community we could look at uh, uh, redesigning the uh, the new church building, although to connect it to the tower at the present time would be a budget issue, uh, and that that's the reason it's not uh, connected in this first phase of work that uh, is being proposed. Do you know how, about how long? the church is looking at before they can connect it? Well, it's, uh, it's, it is a financial issue and uh, there is not a, an exact uh, timeline for when they think they'll be able to afford to make, uh, construct that addition that would connect the two. And, and this is, I don't want to hold this up because uh, the church shouldn't be uh, penalized for other decisions, but I, I will say this, this is one of the reasons I've been so careful about, you know, although I have uh, agreed with preservation community on many things, but there's just certain neighborhoods that things like this tower gets left um, and the promises to the people in the neighborhood of we're gonna do something with it and it was supposed to happen you know, last year and now we, we've got a whole different project, um, which I'm not against because I don't see the neighbors against the church uh, being there except for the concern with parking. How many, you, I'm gonna come back to this, you didn't answer on the parking, how many spaces are available on the property for parking? Uh, I, I believe we have seven or eight available on the property. So the rest of all of the parking will occur in the in the residential neighborhood. Uh, yes, but uh, like I mentioned, this is a immigrant uh, congregation. Uh, families will come uh, together. Uh, I I don't think that the the neighborhood is going to particularly be flooded with vehicles on Sunday morning. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure you don't live right on that street, Mr. James. How many, uh, what's the occupancy? So the, the sanctuary space uh, would seat uh, at a maximum about 200. Okay. 
Um, we probably just need to have some conversation to talk about, um, at, you know, my feeling is you, you get people who want to keep things in neighborhoods that they don't live in. And then when it comes project time, there's nobody that comes to the table with the money to do it, to help. Um, and I, again, I, I'm all for the church because my neighbors have not, the neighbors have not uh, said no, um, but I'm not, I think we need to have some conversation so that we don't take up the time of this committee. Um, but we need to have some conversation what we're going to do with that tower. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll be happy to sit down uh, with you and staff and uh, see what we can figure out. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Motion to close public hearing. Defer to council member. What would you like? Table. Motion to table. Just a minute, sir. Mr. Motion Chair, you're on mute. Council President Pridgen. Item 25, special use permit 2222 Seneca Street for drive through ATMs and N3C zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Anyone here to speak on this item, drive through ATMs on Seneca Street? Yes, hello, my name is Jim Gannon with Scheid Architectural, here representing Five Star Bank. Thanks for your time, I'll be brief. So Five Star Bank is proposing to build uh, approximately 3,300 square feet uh, new retail bank branch where a current parking lot exists at 2222 Seneca Street, South Buffalo. We're here requesting the approval of the special use uh, permit for the drive up ATM kiosks required in the N3C zoning district. We did receive uh, unanimous uh, recommendation from planning board at, uh, at the recent meeting. We have had positive conversation and correspondence with council member Scanlon's office. And we're excited to see this project move forward in South Buffalo. Council member Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I've been in contact with Mr. Gannon in the past about this project. There is currently a, a tremendous amount of development, tremendous amount of activity taking place on Seneca Street. And this sort of infill development is a huge addition to that area. There's some parcels throughout that commercial corridor um, that are vacant. And this one in particular is a, a vast parking lot on a highly visible corner. And this sort of infill development is going to be a, a very much welcome to the addition to the community. So I want to thank Mr. Gannon for reaching out to my office as he has in the past. And I wish uh, Five Star Bank nothing but the best at their new location. Motion to close the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Scanlon. Motion to approve. Seconded by President Pro Temp Scanlon. Item 26, special use permit 378 urban for primary secondary school in N3R zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by council member Nowakowski. I believe Mr. Pollock is here, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pollock, are you here to briefly speak on this item? Okay, it appears he's not here. Uh, Councilmember Nowakowski, what would you like to do with this? Yes, just to make a quick point, um, I've worked really closely with Mr. Pollock and a lot of his associates. It's actually going to be a large project in the Genesee Moselle neighborhood, and they will be putting in a school there, charter school in there, and working tandem out with the crucial um, community center right next to it by also providing them um, additional space. It's something that's going to really um, benefit the neighborhood. So I would like to make a motion to approve. Motion to close public hearing. Chairman, you're muted. Motion to approve by council, seconded by council member Nowakowski. Item 27, zoning map amendment 351 Tacoma from N3R to N3E zone. Motion over the public hearing. 
Seconded by Council Member Bowman. This item at 351 Tacoma, I know Jacob uh, Pirowski is here to speak on it. Jacob, was this um, at the planning board again yesterday? Yeah, so we were at the planning board last night um, and it was approved with some reservations of right, which we're in agreement with. Specifically the board, um, I think they had four or five items. Um, they didn't want us to become a um, auto sales uh, 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 business or an animal care facility, which we're completely fine with. The fear is that changing this from N3R to N3E is going to allow some uses by right. Um, and so with those reservations, it was recommended to come here. The other items that N3E allow that were uh, questionable by the planning board require special use permits. So that would re obviously require a future applicant to come back before the board, which gives the city great oversight and gives the uh, public plenty of time to comment. Um, but for this matter, I, we, we're perfectly in agreement with what they're looking for. And we have a really wonderful project that we're looking to bring to North Buffalo that we think is gonna really enhance a, a fairly unique street in the fact that um, it's, it's, a it's a residential neighborhood, but the street itself feels commercial. There's storefronts, there's a large church, which my client owns, and there's not a single porch or front of a house that opens up on this block. So we're looking at the backs and sides of other homes. Um, so we think this is gonna be a real asset to the community. Okay, are there any residents to speak on this item? No, I've heard, actually, I've received several emails from neighbors who are in support of this project. Um, the concerns people had were brought up by the planning board, um, which they placed conditions on. So we will, uh, after the motion to public hearing, we'll make a recommendation to approve it with the conditions that were set forth by the planning board. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Motion to approve with conditions set by the planning board. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Item 28, planned unit development, 903-951 Ellicott Street and 1100 Michigan in DR zone. Motion moved to public hearing. Okay. Um, Council President Pridgen, this item's in your district. Is there anyone here speaking on this planned unit development? I am not sure, Mr. Chairman. We can ask, I'm sure they've been invited. For Mr. Romanowski has been invited and is connected, but it seems he's not on by audio right now. He may have stepped away from the computer for a moment. Okay, we can um, hold it in abeyance until he comes until the end, if he's not on. Motion to hold the public here in the banks. Seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item 29, zoning map amendment 39 Coit from N430 to DIL zone. Motion to open the public hearing. Seconded by Councilmember Nowakowski. Mr. Chair, I believe maybe somebody is here from Salem's. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Joe Salem, president of Salem Packing Company. And uh, for hundreds, over 150 years, we've strived to stay ahead of our competition so that we can uh, be an asset to not only our employees and our family, as well as the city. And we've discovered a new process uh, with our product. Uh, it's basically an extension of our packaging uh, department. And it's some unique uh, and new equipment that really is not out in the marketplace right now. And uh, we are located at uh, Howard Street at the corner of Coit Street and our property extends down Coit Street. And we have some uh, property that we presently own, but it's not zoned properly. And in order to facilitate the uh, installation of this equipment and introduce this new product, we need to expand our facility approximately 5,000 square feet, 60 feet down uh, to the north on uh, Coit Street. And uh, therefore, this is not properly zoned at the present time for that uh, light industrial use. So that's, that's why we were in front of the uh, planning board a couple of weeks ago and uh, were 
uh, okayed by them. And here we are today. I'm joined by Mike Lukaszewski from uh, Bama Architects that can explain a little further on any of the details that uh, and questions that you may have on this project and request. Sure, so the property is currently uh, zoned N-4-30, which is residential in nature. We're requesting a zoning map amendment to allow for uh, light industrial usage, which would be uh, D-IL uh, zoning. And this would match the adjacent properties at 31 Coit Street and 318 Howard Street. Uh, we did meet with uh, Councilman um, uh, Nowakowski and uh, he was in uh, uh, approval or recommendation of the of the rezoning map amendment. Um, and this would currently take a property that's being used right now as a gravel parking lot and opening up the option to make an addition that would be a continuation of, of the style and nature that the property is, is used for right now. So um, the property to the south and east of this area that is in discussion is also industrial in nature. And then across the street on Coit Street on the west side are a few residences uh, that we wanna be mindful of and be a good neighbor. Thank you very much. Uh, that's another asset to the Fillmore District of Salins being um, at the corner of Coit and Howard. And I did speak with the applicant and he mitigated any issues and questions that I had um, regarding making sure that the residents would have minimal impacts. And this keeps a lot of the other parcels contiguous. So I would like to make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Motion to approve. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item 30, Zoning Map Amendment 139 Vermont from N2R to N2E Zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Councilmember Golombek. Is there anyone here to speak on this item? Okay, if not, then I think we should close the public hearing and table the item. From Motion to close the public hearing. Motion to close the public hearing, seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Wyatt. Item 31, special use permit 1880 Elmwood, AKA 800 Hurdle for drive through in N1S zone. Motion open the public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Golombek. Okay, it looks like there's the agenda is marked that there is a speaker on it. Mr. Kubiniak, are you here to speak on this? Okay, Council Member Golombek, this is in your district. What would you like to do? Um, is there a possibility for me to speak on it? Mr. Absolutely. Hi, it's Marianne Kedron. Uh, we're talking about the Black Rock Harbor and the solar Montante, am I correct? Not yet. The item will be at that item shortly. This item is um, I, the address on this is different. I think that item will be up in, I think, two more items. Councilman Ferrolato, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, may I have the floor? Go ahead, Council Member Glumbeck. Okay, thank you. Um, this is the 1880 Elmwood Avenue project um, <clears throat> that we've been working on uh, for quite some time with Uniland. Um, they've already made quite a few concessions before they even approached us. Um, so I would like to send this without recommendation to the full council um, for next week. Motion to close public hearing. Um, we do have a representative here for this project. Is that Today is National Voter Registration Day. Can everyone turn their phone or their the app on mute, please, when you're not speaking? Okay, the motion is to, Councilmember Member are you here? 
Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. So the motion is to send without recommendation. Yes. Although if there is someone here to speak on it, if they could give a, a brief presentation, it would be appreciated. I can't. I can't access my uh, laptop. I'm sorry. Okay. Is there someone here to give a brief presentation? Yes, council members. My name is Jessica Summers with Sylvester Architects. We are representing the owner and Uniland on this project. Um, it's at the corner of Elmwood and Hurdle. Currently the property is vacant, so the it will be a new build. The surrounding properties are all commercial. There aren't any um, residential areas, so the, the drive-through would not be affecting uh, people's houses like late at night. The operational hours are from or, or until 11 o'clock on Monday through Thursday and until midnight on the weekends. And they have technology that allows the decibel levels to lower uh, when the ambient noise is lowered at, in the evenings. Um, the, there is um, a bank just up the street a little bit and a checkers. Those also have drive throughs directly in that neighborhood. There's other businesses of, of similar um, types in this neighborhood. Um, we have, as Councilman Golenbeck mentioned, we have uh, arranged the site based on feedback from the neighborhood association and himself to maximize um, stacking space to alleviate any traffic concerns. Um, the planning board did recommend to approve with just a, a bit more signage to protect the pedestrians that are walking from their cars in the parking lot into the building because the stacking area is right there. Okay, thank you for the presentation. We appreciate it. There's a motion to send without recommendation. Um, I'm sorry, did we have the motion to close? Was there a motion to close the public hearing yet? Okay, motion to close public hearing, seconded by Council Member Golumbeck. Motion to send without recommendation, seconded by Council Member Golumbeck. Item number 32, zoning map amendment 11 Blackrock Highway from DOG to DIL zone. Motion is to open a public hearing seconded by council member Golumbeck. And this is the item, we just had a speaker who just went to, came to speak, but it was on a different item. So if you wanted to, speak on this now. Um, and then I know Steve Ricca is here to speak on this as well as, and I believe there's others. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Council Member Glombeck. Um, do we have the Andy Rabb here from the Parks Department? Andy Rabb, are you here? I am here. Um, because I think it might be best if perhaps we could start with an explanation of what the project is, because I'm getting conflicting reports uh, from residents versus what I'm getting from the sewer uh, authority and the city of Buffalo about what is exactly being built, where it's actually being built, and if it's actually diminishing any actual parkland um, on Unity Island, something that I've been involved with with the neighborhood since the days of Dave Rutecki, um back, I think, in 1985 when we had our first uh, protest on that island. And so I'd like to have it explained what exactly is happening, um, you know, if we're losing any parkland, because I will categorically state that if we have to lose parkland, that I would vote against this project. Um, and then also why this is the best place for this project, why not somewhere else? Um, so thank you. Hi, this is Katie Sosha from Montante Solar. I'm happy to give um, an overview just in introducing the project in general, if you like. Before you go, if you can do that, I think, Councilmember Glomick, did you want to hear from Mr. Rabb first or how I didn't quite? Um, what, whatever's easier. I would just like to know what this project is, the scope of the project, 
and if there is parkland that's involved with it, because there's been some, you know, some information that's gone back and forth that I have to be honest, I'm a little bit confused because I've been led to believe that there's parkland that's going to have to be given up. But then as I look through the information that I've received, um, it doesn't look like there would be any parkland that would be alienated. Um, so I'd like to know what the scope of the project is first um, so that we alleviate any misconceptions before this begins. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. No, no worries. Um, so yeah, in, in 2019, the city of Buffalo re, uh, released a request for proposal to turn the Unity Island landfill into a solar array. This RFP was released in tandem with the members of the solar consortium in Erie County that includes the University of Buffalo, Buffalo State College, City of Buffalo, Erie County, and Erie County Community College. Uh, Montante Solar was the selected respondent to move forward with uh, transforming the landfill into a solar garden. If Mon uh, Montante Solar, Buffalo Sewer Authority, City of Buffalo, and Edison Energy, the city's uh, and BSA's solar consultant, have been in constant communication regarding plans to transform the landfill on Unity Island into the solar array, our current layout consists of 4.72 megawatt solar system that encompasses most of the landfill area. The project includes 11,788 solar panels, 23 inverters, and a ballasted racking system that would allow the array to sit on top of the landfill without any need for ground penetrations protecting the integrity of that landfill cap. The array is expected to produce over 5 million kilowatt hours uh, of energy annually, offsetting a significant portion of the city, I'm sorry, of BSA's uh, usage. Montante Solar will also be working with master gardeners and environmental consultants to integrate a solar component into the array. Native plants that encourage pollinators like bees and butterflies will be planted in and around the array to help reestablish a pollinator habitat on the landfill. In order for this project uh, to move forward, it will need to be reviewed and require the approval from National Grid for electrical uh, design and utility interconnection, DEC for the modification of the landfill closure report and mechanical engineering uh, the City of Buffalo and Buffalo Sewer Authority for the permitting and approval processes. I know that there were some initial pop public comments about this project being cited as part of the Unity Island Park um, to the north of that railroad bridge, but this is actually part of tax parcel 88.19-1-1, uh, which is designated for use by Buffalo Sewer Authority. And this is Allison Lack from the Buffalo Sewer Authority. And I just wanna chime in to note that initially before the RFP was put out, the city and the Buffalo Sewer Authority did look at a number of sites to try and determine which would be best suited or, or which, what could really move forward to, to have a, um, to produce solar energy. And I just wanna note that this as Katie mentioned this land is designated for BSA use and that the sewer authority is very excited at the prospect of offsetting a portion of our energy use. Okay, thank you. I know we had some other speakers on this. If the other speakers would like if to. If I wish to speak. Mr. James Carr. Yes. Thank you. I'm a 50 year resident of the city of Buffalo and I've been involved in waterfront development. Uh, now the Buffalo Sewer Authority seems to look upon this site as being a closed landfill of no particular significance. However, this uh, property has one advantage and that is it's riverfront property and they aren't making any more riverfront property. The solar park can go as we see throughout Western New York, anywhere. Because once you connect to the grid, the power goes to Buffalo Sewer Authority or anyone else. So uh, we're taking a parcel which is immensely valuable to the residents of the city of Buffalo and Western New York and using it for a use which it is not particularly suited for. Now, <clears throat> historically, the city of Buffalo has tended to overlook the value of waterfront property. Uh, we only need to look at uh, Canal Side, which a few short years ago, they thought the best use was a big box store, Bass Pro. And we see what the difference is there. Uh, 
uh, if we look at what is happening now in the outer harbor, we see the same thing. Uh, the powers to be thought, well, this is a good place to put some housing. And now uh, we have all of a sudden a state park there and a lot of other land which is dedicated for uh, public use. If we take a look at LaSalle Park, which was a largely neglected uh, baseball field in large part, and now it is the recipient of a $50 million uh, advancement of money to make it a uh, signature park. Now, <clears throat> when I grew up, everyone said, why can't the American side be like the Canadian side? And in fact, we have made amazing strides in that direction. From here to Fort Niagara, which is really the waterfront we need to be concerned with, we are returning it to the people. And that is giving Buffalo a new image, an image which Buffalo needs if we are to survive in the 21st century. The quality of life is vitally important, certainly uh, much more important than a uh, park for uh, uh, generating power, which could be generated anywhere uh, in uh, Western New York. So uh, I'd like to say that we need to take the long view here the solar farm does not belong on waterfront land, which is irritable. Uh, the river walk goes right alongside of this site. And the river walk is uh, connected to an additional $50 million, which is being spent to connect Buffalo with things such as the Erie Canal Trail, uh, the new trail to uh, South Buffalo and the Southern Tier. Uh, <clears throat> This is part of an emerging uh, development important to the health of people of Western New York. If you look around the city, people are riding bicycles all over the place. Five or 10 years ago, that did not exist. So we need to take the long view. A solar park is a short view. It's of no value. That park, can, the solar park can go anywhere in Western New York and be just as efficient in terms of producing power for the Buffalo Sewer Authority. We need to think ahead. We not look behind and try and replicate the past, which is what this project is doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve Ricca. Thank you, Mr. Ferroletto. Thank you members of the council for the opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, my name is Steve Rick. I live at 504 West Sullivan. I've lived on the west side for the past 25 years. I've submitted detailed written comments dated September 7th and September 17th. I'll, I'll try to hit the high points because I know your time is valuable. I urge the Council Legislation Committee to recommend denial of this proposed industrial rezoning and use for the following reasons. I and other city residents use this parkland regularly. I use it hundreds of times. Uh, there's been zero community outreach, whatever site selection process may have occurred among a, of a consortium uh, was news to me until I read about this in the paper. This part of the park is raised up much higher than the area north of the railroad tra tracks. It has magnificent views that you can't see from the lower part, abundant plants, birds, animals, and importantly, respite from large crowds that are forming in the northern portion of the park. There's simply a demand for parkland that exceeds the supply. The value of open space is even greater during the COVID pandemic. Second major reason, Councilman Gollenbeck had the wisdom to sponsor the formal dedication of this rare waterfront open space in 2001. And he did so in collaboration with his constituents with the North District Waterfront Review Committee and numerous city residents. I supplied a copy of the 2001 resolution that uh, formally dedicates this park. It, it states that it broadly covers the area north of the Buffalo Sewer Authority plant. The proposed solar site is not owned by the Buffalo Sewer Authority, it's owned by the City of Buffalo Division of Real Estate. The idea that this piece of property has been designated for use by the Buffalo Sewer Authority, I've located no evidence of that fact. In fact, the city's own ORS report is incorrect with respect to zoning. It lists the zoning of this parcel at issue as light industrial, when in fact, of course, it's OG. That's why we have a rezoning uh, application before you. 
Uh, the 2001 parkland dedication also states that the proposed park is an ideal use for this picturesque site along the mighty Niagara River. And that enormous resources have gone into the park plan so far. Countless hours of community meetings and millions of dollars in public funding spent to remediate the site in a way that is compatible with its use as a park. All of this effort and all of this money was designed to produce an outcome where you can review, reuse what something would casually called just a landfill. The exact same thing could be said of the Outer Harbor, which has also got nothing but fill in it. So it's really not a material observation to state that this is just a landfill. It's an insult to the efforts that went into making it uh, available for public use. Uh, thirdly, the proposal's unlawful. Denying full public access would violate multiple New York statutes, including the requirements for New York State legislative approval of a parkland alienation bill and public input during a full environmental review. Again, we had no idea this was happening. Uh, I'm, I know that uh, our council members are very concerned about listening to the public and this should be no exception, particularly with this rare and finite waterfront resource. It's unclear whether there were any stakeholders involved in the study that selected the site. The New York State General City Law clearly provides that parklands are inalienable and require legislative approval to alienate. Even without Councilman Galambeck's resolution and the 2001 dedication, the case law holds that property becomes dedicated parkland by implication. This is a second way it's a parkland due to such things as continuous public use over time and master planning. The Buffalo Sewer Authority representative admitted during the planning board that the public has been using this parkland and has been permitted to do so. I'm practically on a first name basis with the guard at the Buffalo Sewer Authority gate. I'm there that frequently. Destroying this rare public vista wouldn't just betray the hard work uh, that earned the parkland dedication. This would be a waste of millions of dollars of public money used specifically for remediation to allow public use. Nobody's calling the Outer Harbor just a landfill. Again, this prior state funding could also obligate the city to provide substitute parkland. In certain instances where public monies are used to create parkland and then you try to alienate it, uh, you've got to uh, compensate the public. And that's going to be impossible here with our finite waterfront resources. So let's not compound the mistakes of the past. Uh, I mentioned that another way that parkland can become dedicated by implication is master planning. As far as master planning goes, this proposal clearly contradicts, contradicts basically every city planning and regional waterfront planning effort I can think of. From the 2004 comp plan to the 2016 land use plan, the 2017 green code zoning designation. Again, a 20, 2017 green code has this as green open space waterfront overlay district property for a reason. And when you look at the drawing that encircles uh, the park, it, it, it coincides exactly with what the, the users of the park have considered it to be as such for years. This Can violates New York coastal zone principles. It violates the recently adopted local waterfront re revitalization, revitalization planning uh, priorities. And it comes, runs counter to the, the historic Niagara, Niagara River Greenway legislation. As Mr. Carr stated earlier, why can't we have what we see on the other side of the river? This is one of the reasons. All of these plans don't just call for preserving waterfront space. They call for increasing waterfront access to our neighborhoods. I'm sure that the people who used to use Riverside Park long regret the fact that the 190 obliterated most of it. Uh, what parkland is next? If you rezone this parkland to industrial, it sets a dangerous precedent. The consequences here would be, would be devastating. When I was at the planning board meeting, there was a lot of concern about setting a precedent, changing the zoning of certain small uh, residential parcels. The consequences here would be in perpetuity, light industrial property on our waterfront. You could have manufacturing, processing, fabrication, distribution facilities, some as high as four stories. And the solar panels could become obsolete. So city residents should not be forced to choose between ample green space on the waterfront and clean energy. This isn't a close call. Municipalities all over the country comments. are removing interest. Thank you for your comments, Steve. We're moving on to the next speaker. Marianne. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a long time resident of the Black Rock and Riverside area and a pretty active community activist. Um, I know a lot about what's going on in the community and I have to admit there was no public outcry. There was no public call for meetings. There was no informational sessions regarding any of this. The first that any of us saw about this is when it hit the paper. And believe me, we know a lot about what's going on in our community. So this was a total surprise and quite frankly, um, not a very pleasant one. Um, using uh, some comment was made that using uh, someone else's backyard and then complaining when they put a fence on it is what this proposal was like. And I would like to contend that this is more like our front yard as a community asset and, and an international one uh, as an asset as well. Um, this is a significant waterfront and having somebody tell us that we cannot use it is truly unacceptable at this point. Um, we have worked very, very hard and there have been a number of environmental organizations that worked continuously for Ramsar designation, wetland designation um, in, of international proportions. Putting solar arrays in the middle of that does not necessarily make sense. LWRP, uh, Ramsar designation, the Birdway, the DEC, the Greenway, all would oppose this use on this particular section of waterfront. Um, I cannot believe that after 20 years we're even considering this. Um, on the other hand, I do appreciate solar energy. I would like to think that there is some kind of an amenable um, way to get both of these things, not necessarily in the same place. Um, I think the size of the array is quite questionable. And particularly in the midst of two parks, one an underground railroad designated um, preservation site and the other one a Unity Island um, site that has seen use by our immigrant community four, five, tenfold what we had expected. Um, I'm also questioning how uh, DEC would allow us to put a solar array on something where we have repeatedly asked for community assets to be put on that site. Um, and been told that it's impossible to put anything on there because it's a capped field. And in fact, if you did notice and get out there, you would see that it is a um, native planting site already. So we can save you a lot of money by just leaving it the way it is. Um, I think a public comment period is something that should at minimum be required because there are a number of people who would appreciate some comment on this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Were there any other speakers on this? I can speak about the DEC um, approval to put solar on a landfill if you like, um, or we can save that for another time. Uh, I'll defer to Councilmember Glumbeck, who's on the call. Councilmember Glumbeck, what would you like to do here? Uh, I'd like to hear that, please. Sure. So both NYSERDA and, um, and DEC support um, transforming landfills into solar arrays. Um, there are There's a lot that needs to go into it in order to get DEC approval. Um, modification of a landfill closure report is key. Um, we would need to work with an environmental consultant who would need to go through and take measurements um, for the landfill as, long, as well as um, the historic uh, data that is provided. Um, and we, it, there are certain uh, weight limitations um, that need to be uh, considered when, when doing that. Um, that is why we, in our proposal, did not propose to put solar over the entire landfill array. There are portions of that array that are um, have a pretty steep slope and they just wouldn't um, we wouldn't be able to put solar on those portions safely um, without uh, hurting the integrity of the landfill cap. So it is a, it is a use, um, it's actually incentivized um, even more by NYSERDA. They do give a, a special incentive to repurpose solar um, uh, landfills into solar and um, the DEC does allow that as well. The DEC is aware of this project. A FOIA request was required in order to um, get the information needed for the landfill request. And upon you know, their just initial review, they didn't see, um, obviously we haven't gotten into the permitting process yet, but they didn't see anything that would deter solar on this site. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no more speakers, we will. Uh, this is Andy Rapp, Deputy Commissioner of Public Works for Parks and Recreation, um, just stating that uh, to our knowledge, the 
park is designated north of the Buffalo Sewer Authority property. Um, we do not maintain or manage the area south of the road, the hill, as part of Unity Island Park. Um, and since 2010, uh, we have not spent any money from any parks capital dollars to improve that area. Uh, the only space south of the road uh, that is maintained by parks is the river walk or shoreline trail that is designated through a separate action. Uh, but it was always our understanding, at least it has been my understanding since we've been taking care of Unity Island Park, uh, that it was the area north of the Sewer Authority property. <clears throat> okay, Council Majority Leader Rivera. Thank you very much. I, um, I represent the southern part of um, what is Unity Island, which is Broderick Park, which is also a landfill. Um, but it's sacred ground. It is the uh, part of the Underground Railroad. It is where anglers go. It is where families go there to fish. It is where people go to reflect. Uh, I am a strong proponent of green space, particularly on the waterfront. I mean, there are no other spaces left, or very few spaces left on our waterfront, like Unity Island, like Broderick Park, like the Furman Boulevard, like LaSalle Park. Uh, those are the crown jewels of the city, and we should protect and expand green space. Uh, I agree. I, I, I am for green energy and windmills and and uh, solar panels, but this is not the right place for that. I, it, it's surprising to me, and I agree with, uh, is it Marianne and Steve, um, who uh, have a great idea, and I agree with them. Just because it's called the landfill, um, uh, it, it's been transformed. I mean, I've gotten the opportunity to go down there to Unity Island and see the people that gather at that park with their families. It may be a landfill, but it's, it, it, if you just look at it, it's green space. And I think we need to maintain, and not only maintain, I think we should be adding green space uh, to the city of Buffalo. If you compare the city of Buffalo to other cities, in terms of green space, we're on the bottom end. Uh, you think we have a lot of green space, but when you look at comparisons, we're way under where other cities are with regards to green space, especially on the waterfront. So. Uh, I'll support the council member, and I, and I know he'll support uh, his community on this, but I'm a proponent of green space and not um, doing anything on the waterfront, especially by the river's edge. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I know, council member Glombuck, I know you're having issues with your computer, so I can't see you. Did you want to add some comments? Um, since the council member Glombeck's not here, I think we should table this item. Um, and so motion to close public hearing. Hey, can motion. you hear me? Joel. Yes. Council member Glombeck. Yeah. Um, I would like to recommend table uh, the item, but now that you're here, we'll go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to recommend tabling it, um, and following some of the recommendations of what uh, Mary Ann and Steve and others had recommended. Motion to close public hearing. Seconded by Council Member Golombek. Motion to table. Seconded by Council Member Golombek. Item 35, Michigan Sycamore Historic District. Okay, items open. This item is This item is open. I believe we needed to schedule a public hearing. Um, this is the council member whose district this is in have some input on when the public hearing should be scheduled. No, at your convenience, at the, at the committee's convenience. Okay. Um, I believe it's the same as a, a landmark for a historic district. We need at least 15 days notice. Okay. So that puts us out to which October 20th would be the earliest. Okay, then we will set the public hearing for October 20th. 
Motion to table. Motion to table, seconded by Council President Pridgen. There's no other items, motion to adjourn. I, I believe we do have Mr. Romanowski on the oh, line yes, now we for- have, uh, Item 28 that was held in abeyance. And yes, Eric. good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Romanowski, if you wanna speak on that item. Uh, Mr. Farrelletto, Councilman Farrelletto, rest of the council, thank you very much. I apologize for the technical difficulties that we had a little bit earlier. Uh, with me this afternoon, I have Eric Ekman from McGuire Development uh, as well. What's before the council is a request for a planned unit development for uh, a series of parcels at the corner of Ellicott, East North Street, Best on the north side, and Michigan on the east side. Uh, what McGuire Development is requesting is a plan unit development, which just expands upon the permitted uses for the parcel from those that are presently allowed by the uh, the DM, uh, I'm sorry, not DM, it's the district residential district, DR district, uh, that's on the, on the site. And I'm going to turn very briefly over to Eric Ekman from McGuire Development and let him speak to uh, some of the challenges and in, in their future goals for the development site. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Eric Ekman. I'm a vice president of development and acquisitions at McGuire Development Company. And I'm pleased to be here to, today to talk about our PUD request. So through this PUD request, we hope to provide greater opportunities and create more vibrancy for the surrounding neighborhood. Our site is large, it's over 11 acres. Um, so if we pursue residential as a pr principal use across that site, the development time frame be su substantially prolonged due to unit absorption and market realities. We hope to activate the site in a much timelier fashion. Mainly, we are requesting uh, some flexibility with our principal uses to support redevelopment and better integrate with the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. Through our planning process, we established a number of objectives for the site. These are to create a vibrant, and mixed use city block, successfully transition to the surrounding uh, urban context, provide a variety of mixed income housing options. Now SAA EVI is already proposing um, 230 affordable apartments, both for families and seniors in the Northwest corner of the site. We also had an objective to connect visually and functionally with the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. And lastly, to accommodate principal professional office and medical, related uses for increasing the city's employment opportunities. We strongly feel that the PUD is needed to support a healthy mix of uses and to facilitate full activation of this exciting city block. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman, uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, Councilman Farrelletto, it's, it's Mark Romanowski once again. And just to briefly go over the, the proposed changes from the uh, DR district to what we're proposing here. Uh, with respect to the uses, it's really to allow in those commercial uses that the DR district doesn't permit. So the DR district permits almost exclusively residential districts. And by uh, the, the PUD as it's written is designed to add things such as schools, medical clinics, markets, restaurants, retail and service, professional offices, critically research and laboratory facilities. Uh, those are some of the, the highlights that hotel as well, uh, and educational facilities. So the, the idea was to bring it more in line with the uses that are actually permitted in the DM district, and, and I'm correctly saying that this time, uh, the medical district that's immediately to the south of this. So it really brings a nice transition uh, as we move northward towards Best Street and the residential districts. Now, with respect to the physical, physical aspects of it, the, we are requesting additional height uh, we're looking at, in particular, uh, up to eight, uh, eight stories on the uh, south side, uh, no, later, no, later, no less than three, but as much as eight, along with a step back provision. Uh, but we're, we're restricting the height along Best Street. Uh, and in fact, there was an amendment that we just submitted that's to, to clarify that. The original draft of it, when we looked at it a little bit more closely and spoke to the planning board, uh, we felt that the, the language of the second and third paragraphs of the original draft looked like the exception, the step back exception applied also along Best Street and that was not the intent. So the intent is at a depth of 60 feet from Best Street, uh, you have the, the maximum, which is the same 
uh, now, which is 66 feet in height. Critically, the SAA EBI provisions, uh, projects that are, that are currently before the planning board, both of those are under that, that height. So they're, uh, what you're gonna see on the Northeast side of the site is, is uh, already in front of the planning board and they're hoping to move forward next spring. So that, that, that uh, development is not gonna be impacted really significantly by this PUD. It's really meant to help facilitate the development of the rest of the parcel. So we believe that this is consistent with the zoning that's surrounding the site and facilitates the anticipated redevelopment and, and, gives, and gives, quite frankly, the developers a little more flexibility on uh, pretend, uh, potential uses on the site. So that's, that's the scope of our presentation. We're certainly happy to answer any questions that uh, any of the council members might have. Colleagues, any questions? Council President Bridget. Thank you, sir, and thank you uh, to Mark. It seems like we're together all day today um, yes, on other projects, and uh, to Eric. Uh, just a couple of questions. I know that this is the PUD. Um, right now, when you said the northeast corner, and I was aware that that's still uh, tabled at planning, correct? Yes, that's that's correct, Councilman. I, we, we actually observed the meeting yesterday, and uh, it, it just appeared to be a technological issue, and and being able to present full details on the project as far as materials, colors, et cetera. Uh, they didn't have, the planning board didn't have concerns about the uses. Uh, and also critically, and I, and I forgot to mention that the planning board had no, uh, no comments in its recommendation to, uh, to the council. They unanimous, unanimously recommended it to the council. And I made the tweak in response to just discussions that, was, that were had by the planning board. Well, I'm glad to see something happening on the site and I'm sure the residents will be glad. Um, it is. It has been an eyesore for many years now, uh, with the with um, the uh, demolition. Uh, so I'm glad to see something. The residents, um, most of the residents, are concerned, and I know there is an affordability and a um, a in in this uh, project. There were current residents that were displaced from a uh, Pilgrim Village. What are there plans to bring them back into the new development? Uh, Councilman uh, Pridgen, I, I can't speak to exactly SAE EVI's plans on the, uh, the past residents. I know the intent, the existing residents um, will be uh, relocated and accommodated into the new SAA EVI facility. In fact, HUD requires it. So it's, it's not even a point up for discussion or debate with SAA EVI. That's their, uh, that's their requirement. And Eric, I don't know if you have anything else you can, you can add, but you may have some more knowledge on that particular topic? Uh, just the uh, main point that uh, SAA EBI is actually increasing the number uh, of affordable units um, on the site um, and, and do fully plan to work with existing residents and, and accommodate their relocation. Are you aware, Eric, of any uh, of the residents who or were there? I know that Half of the comp, or I, I, I don't know the number, but there was a big portion of the complex that was emptied out, um, and residents um, expected they were going to be able to come back. Are you aware of that, or does anybody mention that? I can. Um, speak. I, I can't speak to that point. Yeah, if, uh, Councilman Pridgen, I can speak to it from from some uh, history of that. So the demolition that took place on the that would be the southwest corner of the site. Uh, for what was the Campus Square project many years ago. Uh, what happened there is, and, and I can't speak to how the, the former developer actually managed the process, but the intent was they had vacancies and people that, that were being evicted and they were taken out of the remaining building so that the people that were in good standing were moved from the, the structures that were demolished into the uh, the remaining buildings in the in the units that were vacated. They also did some improvements on those as well. So it was kind of a uh, combination of improvement of old units and relocation of people during that process. Now, you know whether or not that took place completely, McGuire can't speak to it because we didn't we didn't manage it. We were we were there as a co-developer on the southwest corner. We didn't manage that piece of it. And I can tell you that SAA EVI has assured us. That that is not going to happen, and that, as Eric mentioned, that in fact there's going to be an excess number of units. Um, we can certainly pass along your concerns regarding uh, providing an invite back to those individuals to SAEVI so that they're aware of it. We're, we're happy to do that. Uh, 
Yeah, and I would appreciate that. I mean, I don't know uh, how many people may have been affected and who were kind of promised that in the new unit, you know, it, once it was built that they, they could be considered for it. Uh, but it was the same way, although it's not in my district, that I pressed with Shoreline um, to make sure that now that we're putting up something new, that those who may be, have been uh, displaced, that they have an opportunity to come back into, a, um, into the new units. And I'm glad to hear, and I think I've expressed this to you uh, both, well, at, le at least um, to McGuire, um, that there will be affordable, comp, you know, uh, pro, um, apartments, and that you are expanding that in that area because it is very, very much needed. So, uh, my hats off to you. Um, last question: So, total uh, low-income units, how many will there be? Currently, um, SAA EBI is proposing two hundred and thirty. That consists of one hundred and thirty-two uh, family affordable. Uh, apartments and then 98 um, uh, senior apartments. And from the does not represent the end of um, right. proposed housing for the site. So that's just the first phase Absolutely. Uh, to kind of unlock the rest of the site for additional development. So when the site is open for the additional development, will there be a noticeable difference in the area of affordable housing and the area of market rate housing? We certainly don't expect that, uh, Councilman Pridgen. The, the uh, uh, quality of the product that SAA EVI develops is, is very high. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see their, their plans, uh, but they're, they're a fantastic looking project. And uh, quite frankly, it's to everyone's benefit that all of these are high quality facilities. And, and uh, the, the real goal of this PUT isn't to create uh, some kind of separation between the low income housing and, and something else, it's to say, we need to do more than just housing. We can't do a thousand units of low-income housing on this site. It just, it, it's not going to work for the market, and and uh, it'll never get financed, quite frankly. So well, the idea is to mix it up. And I, I don't want to concentrate poverty, um, and I also don't want it sectioned off. Where I want to make sure, and I'll take another look at this, but I want to speak it early in the process that we don't want where people who are low-income, you know, there's a fence, there's a you know, a garden that separates people, if they're gonna be on the site, they're all gonna be on the site, is is um, is really what I'm just continuing to encourage even as things change. Yeah, I, I can say that certainly that, that uh, McGuire hasn't requested that of SAA EVI. And in fact, the site plans that were presented are, they're, they're wide open plans. So there isn't any segregation between their lots and our adjacent properties that, that we see going forward and, and certainly don't anticipate any. And Eric, it, almost, it, you know, if I could just add one point, um, the success of redeveloping that block, and we're not looking at this as parcels, we're looking at this as a block, the success to re redeveloping this block is to integrate all the pieces together and make it feel like a vibrant urban community. If we put up fences and walls and separate the parcels, then we won't be achieving our goal. Our goal is really to activate this in uh, this block and integrate it into the context successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Hey, are there any more speakers on this item? Um, I'm a community member that would like to speak about this. Go uh, ahead. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Amy Manning. I own property on Best Street, directly across the street from this development. Um, I just first want to say that my family is really excited about the idea of new development happening in this area. However, we've been very concerned about the lack of transparency with the developers and the surrounding community. Um, we were not informed about the community meeting regarding this development and only found out about it on the Ellicott District Facebook page the day of, which was not adequate time for anyone to change their schedule to attend either of the meetings. Um, and when I expressed my displeasure of not finding out about this meeting with adequate notice, the district page replied that they had only found out about it that day as well. Um, I've also talked to my neighbors um, and other property owners on this block and had no they had no idea that there was a community meeting about this development um so we haven't really had the opportunity to see what your overall plans are um other than what's was in the uh pdf for today's meeting um overall my concerns are that the variances that you're requesting and the additional use permits that are being sought after are too broad and too large for the property 
Um, we already have a lot of multi-use spaces in Buffalo that are empty, even within a short block of here. We have empty office spaces, we have empty storefronts, we have empty restaurants. We have brand new buildings that have uh, very few uh, renters in them. So there doesn't necessarily seem to be a lot of call for additional services that you're talking about for some of these additional uses in this area specifically. Um, and I'm also concerned about the density of this um, overall plan uh, based off of the number of people that this may bring in. Um, the amount of parking that's on your overall site plan is woefully inadequate. We already have a parking issue in the fruit belt area. Um, and there doesn't even appear to be a parking spot for each uh, unit that you want to put in there, plus all of the other civic and other ideas that you have to go on um, in this area. So I'm very concerned that the parking is not adequate for the um, size space and the number of people that you're planning. And also very, very concerned about the idea of a hotel or hostel being allowed in this development um, and the transient nature of that use and how history shows us that people who are not invested in a community tend to treat the community as though they're not invested in it. Um, and I would really like to see this excluded as a potential use. Um, and in addition, the height variances that you're speaking, they're not small. We have no, I really have no issue with small variances of one to two feet in any direction. Um, but the idea of um, stepping down into the community with only a five, five story building um, from where we are right now um, is, that's kind of like, hey, let's look at a humongous concrete wall for the rest of your life. Um, we have pretty nice views of the medical campus right now, and I'd like to have a view of the medical campus and not just a view of a concrete wall. So that is, I would be very supportive of a scaled down plan, but this plan right now seems to be um, oversized for this space. Okay, thank you very much for the comments. I certainly appreciate it. Did we have anyone else speaking on this item? No? Okay. Majority Leader. Uh, what would you like to do with this? Would you like to table it? Well, I, th I think that, um, and we received the public, as uh, Dr. Manning said, we received it. We put it up as soon as we got it. Um, either uh, Mark or Eric, can you talk to us about what happened with that meeting as far as the notification to the neighborhood? Uh, it, actually, I, I can, uh, Councilman. I think there's some confusion here or overlap between the SAA EDI efforts and uh, the plan unit development uh, proposal that, that McGuire is requesting the board right now. Uh, the SAA EDI did have some community meetings that I understand dated back as far as March. Uh, the success of those or otherwise, I'm not uh, entirely sure uh, on how successful they were in, in doing that. Um, we, pro we provided our materials actually to the city dating back to August. Uh, so these materials have, have been in front of uh, and, and available to the public for some time. Our plans aren't very specific. In fact, uh, any future development that might occur on the site is going to have to go through a site plan review process. So concerns over aesthetics, density, parking, et cetera, that doesn't get impacted by this, this PUD proposal. That'll be something that's subject to site plan review when that individual project comes through. Um, I'd also comment that the density concerns, there's really not a significant change between what's allowed in the district residential and what we're proposing. The district residential allows five story buildings right up on Best Street. So what we're proposing doesn't change that at all. This is more of a step back towards the eight, 10 and 13 story uh, structures of the medical campus. So we're, at, we're a step down from those on the south side of East North Street, and we continue to step down through this, this PUD proposal all the way to, over to Best Street. So we maintain that, that step scale back towards the, uh, uh, the medical campus. So I, I would disagree with that, you know, that particular consideration. Uh, but, um, and, and certainly any individual project concerns are best dealt with at the planning board when a project comes forward. And uh, there, there were some comments at the planning board meeting yesterday regarding SAA EDIs uh, proposal similar to Dr. Manning's comments. Yeah, I, I think with with hearing that and and again we 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 got the information about the meeting, put it out there as soon as we got it, um, and I think that uh, this we probably need to have a 
very uh, well advertised community meeting, even for the PUD. And the reason I think so is because I think if we, if, if uh, McGuire gets off on the wrong foot on this, um, as we had discussions in earlier meetings, uh, Mark, it, I think that what will what will occur is that the community uh, will feel that they are not involved in this from the beginning. Um, I've always, even when meeting said, community has to be involved, let's do that from the beginning. Um, I think to wait until the planning board, to wait until other uh, plans and drawings come before this community might be too late. Um, because and then what is then told the community, well, we've already spent all this money to do these drawings, we've spent this, we've done this. And I think it's important. Um, so what I would ask is, um, and I'm sure McGuire in the past has been very accommodating, and I would trust in this one, they would be also uh, that we come up with a mutually agreed upon date to re-engage the community, whether that's through Zoom or whatever way uh, you want to do it. Um, before uh, this council makes any action on this PUD. I think community always feel like this. Community has to be involved from day one or else it just, it makes it for a much longer process uh, that I don't think is necessary by just having those real conversations. So Understood, Councilman, and, and we'll be uh, happy to facilitate it. And uh, if the timing permits, we'll, we'll make sure to incorporate SAA EBI into those uh, meetings as well. So let's get that meeting scheduled and talked about afternoon meeting, evening meeting where uh, people uh, can attend. Thank you. Yeah, sir. certainly. And we'll keep your office informed when that occurs. Thank you. Majority Leader, we could table this. Motion to table. Seconded by Council President Pridgen. Motion to adjourn. Oh, hang on, guys. Uh, I was having connection issues before. Uh, my name's Justin Seidel. I was on item 30 and my audio wasn't coming through. It was tabled. Can we revisit that? Mr. What was Chairman? the action on that item? Uh, so that was that was changing zoning. Just, from, if you can hold on one, if you can just hold on a second, Malcolm. What was the action we took on that item? The tabled item, sir. Okay. So we will revisit item thirty. Motion to revisit item thirty. Thank you. Seconded by Council Member Bowman. Justin, if you could give us a, a three-minute rundown on this item, please. Sure. So my name's Justin. I'm the owner of 139 Vermont Street. Uh, I'm teaming up with Westside Community Services to open up a food pantry in our vacant retail space. Uh, to reopen the retail space as a food pantry, we were required to change the zoning from N2R to N2E. Um, the planning board is supportive of this change on the condition that we exclude specific as of right uses uh, that could potentially have negative influences on the neighbors. Um, those uses that they're looking to have excluded and were supportive of is excluding a hotel or hostel, uh, an animal care establishment, uh, vehicle rental and sales, or a laboratory. Um, we hope that you guys approve this so that we can bring the food pantry to this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Majority Leader Rivera. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I support this. I have uh, spoken to Kate, the executive director of Westside Community Services. Uh, there is a need for a food pantry. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, did they purchase the building or, are they, or was the space donated to them? So we own the property. It's a vacant uh, storefront and three occupied apartments. So they're going to sign a, a long-term lease with us uh, for the uh, retail space to open up a food pantry but we, we will retain ownership. Okay, motion, then motion was to close, the, we have closed the public hearing. Motion is now to approve. Okay, motion to approve, seconded by council member Wyatt. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by council member, no, council president Pridgen has the floor before we, before we adjourn. Sorry. I don't, I don't think uh, council member uh, why it is a member of this committee. Okay, seconded by Council President Pridgen. <laughs> sure. Motion to adjourn, seconded by Council President Pridgen.